Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Brotherhood of Gaming. I'm William Morris. Right now, it is a special time for us, because you see, back around 10 years ago, when we were first starting on this channel, it was pretty much a different time of YouTube. We had the creativity juices flowing, we were trying out new things, and there was really no established identity yet here, and Lord knows if we ever truly found one. But one of the first videos we ever did was a live action skit based on the Streets of Rage video game. Uh, <laughs> it's cringeworthy, but you know what? Everybody had to start somewhere. But guess what? Streets of Rage 4, 20 years in the making, is finally right around the corner. Sega has answered our prayers and is finally delivering a continuation on the famed classic beat-em-up series. And I cannot think of a better time than right now to talk about one of our favorite video game franchises, the Streets of Rage series. Oh. Alright. Hold up. I think I need to make something pretty clear. Like, even though I did grow up with the series back on the Genesis, I never owned the original Streets of Rage. I actually, like probably many Sega fans out there, got to originally play it as part of the Sega Genesis six-pack cartridge. You know, it was a pretty damn good package deal considering everything that was on it. I mean, you got Revenge of Shinobi, Super Hang-On, Columns, Golden Axe, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Streets of Rage. That's a hell of a deal, man. Could you imagine if Nintendo came out with something like this back in the day for the Super Nintendo? Like, let me know in the comments below what you think would have been on that. So, you know what? The time is right. I can feel the blood flowing. The juices are flowing. I feel like kicking some ass. Let's talk about Streets of Rage. All right, so let's take a trip back to the Sega Genesis Mega Drive during its prime years and explore how a game like Streets of Rage gets made. Sega, as usual, was in its fierce competition with Nintendo when it came to video game dominance at the time. Sonic was doing wonders for Sega's brand, but they were going to need more iconic games in different genres to bring in new players. And this is pre-internet, so they definitely weren't going to get Google's help on what gamers wanted to play. And the Super Nintendo was already boasting an impressive lineup. So the only reasonable idea was to hang out at the good old video arcade and see what kind of games drew people in the most. Capcom was already a dominant provider in the game market, making plenty of smash hits on the NES and arcade. However, they were mainly good at one type of game over the others, fighting games. Oh yeah, that's the good stuff. Games like Final Fight and Street Fighter were obviously some arcade favorites, and pretty easy on the eyes. Final Fight, in particular, was the game that caught Sega's attention, though, and thusly began the idea that Sega wanted another beat-em-up video game of their own, one that would rival the competition and stand as a first-party game. And they definitely didn't want to half-ass this job, either. Bringing in their top-tier devs, Sega began working on what would become known in Japan as Bare Knuckle, but to the rest of the world, Streets of Rage. As far as development history goes, that's frankly all I really know. The rest, as they say, is history. Streets of Rage delivered exactly what it set out to do, and became a smashing success. That to this day is still a joy to play. As far as the first game is concerned, it's got staying power. I personally think it's still fun to occasionally pop in and play from beginning to end. Even more so if you bring a friend along. While I can't say the game has aged like fine wine, its graphics yeah, can have that sort of out of focus look. The gameplay is what keeps it fun and playable though. It's a very simple game with the basic fundamentals of what a quality beat up should be, and it doesn't mess it up. Okay, it doesn't look as graphically impressive as, say, Final Fight, but you know what? It really doesn't need to. The real strengths of Streets of Rage 1 are how it uses all of its assets. The engine, from what I know, was largely the same one I believe used in Sega's other well-known arcade beat-em-up, Golden Axe. Which honestly would explain why the character sprites are much smaller than your average beat-em-up. Unlike Golden Axe, Streets of Rage kept the level terrain steady and flat and didn't demand the player try to do any platforming in between rounds. Thank God. Just get over here quickly. 
Oh shit. Oh! <laughs> I'm sorry! Okay. Okay, so. Now! Oh! Come oh. on! Come on, game! <gasps> no! I... Oh! Come on, game! I had all that momentum, then you stopped me! <laughs> no! All you need to focus on in this game was simply staying alive, defeating the oncoming force, and using any of the minimal weapons you can come across on the ground to help make that easier. And if you had friends, trying desperately not to hit them in the crossfire. Or they weren't going to stay friends with you for very long. Trust me, I've uh, ended a few friendships. Sad story. So, now before we go on further, I think it's a good time to talk about the story for this game and the characters. Now, being that I had this game on the Genesis 6 pack, I didn't have any of the original game's manuals. But thankfully, Streets of Rage is one of those rare exceptions of retro games where the game itself actually explains the plot for you. But for added clarity, I went ahead and got the manual anyway. In the big city, which we can assume is probably New Chicago, Angeles, York, a secret crime syndicate has overrun the city, corrupting the governments and buying out the police, leaving the civilians in fear at the mercy of those who prey on the fearful. Looting, random violence, and destruction are the norm. The leader of the syndicate is an unknown man, but he's got all the power of a crime lord, so he's virtually untouchable. Despite all this, there is still hope. Three dedicated officers who have been constantly trying to fight the crimes and the corruption within their own police force had gotten fed up with being turned down by their superiors that our three young heroes, Axel Stone, Adam Hunter, and Blaze Fielding, all quit the force in order to become vigilantes and take justice into their own hands. That means taking the actions to the streets of Goth- uh, wherever the hell this is, and punching evil right in its face, and oh god is it satisfying. As soon as you start the game, you can select which character you want to fight as. Blaze Fielding, our leading lady heroine, is the weakest of the three, but is also the fastest on the field. Adam Hunter is our black hero with a pretty head of hair. He's the slowest character with movement speed, but he makes up for it by having good stats and power and jumping. Last but not least, we have Axel Stone, who's technically the face of the series and arguably is the most balanced. Good with offense and speed, but unlike Adam, Axel isn't good at getting airtime. Yeah, the joke kind of wrote itself there, didn't it? White men can jump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from there, the game begins. Be it in one or two players, you will travel through eight different but appropriately themed stages, each loaded with a plethora of criminals, complete with a boss fight at the end. The only difference is, if you're playing with a friend, there will be an extra boss fight waiting to kill you as well. The first stage is the city streets. Now, I've always claimed that, it, well, at least for me, presentation is a big deal when playing a game, and its first impressions are just as important. Streets of Rage's visuals may not be up to snuff with what you'd expect to see in an arcade, but, uh, Jesus, Sega's developers definitely knew the ins and outs of the Genesis hardware and how to make the most of it, and graphically, Streets of Rage does not look bad at all. The first stage is vibrant and colorful with some very nice detail in its background, with the crazy neon lights and the detailing inside the glass windows, not to mention the foreground assets like the street lamps and the cars that give us a really good image on depth. It's still pretty damn cool. Yeah, I will full on admit that this is the little kid side of me talking. Hit me with some creative visuals and a lot of bright and saturated colors and you've definitely got my attention. The colors, Duke! The colors! Combat wise, you can imagine how the game plays just by looking at it. Each character has their own four-hit combo, which will do the job and pretty much be your main way of attacking from beginning to end. There are some small variations, though. By tapping both the attack and jump button at the same time, Axel and friends can do this sort of one-hit back attack. It's not really good for much and doesn't do a lot of damage, but <laughs> unless you want to show off, hey, go for it. Otherwise, I suppose it's one way to help with crowd control if you have enemies coming at you from both sides. Speaking of which, it can be easy sometimes, especially in later stages, to get a little overwhelmed with that exact problem. Occasionally, one of the jerks will grab you from behind, and if that happens, you can quickly kick out of their hold, knocking down anyone unfortunate enough to be in the way, including an ally, and then giving Rabby a toss by pressing jump and attack. Of course, part of the fun is being able to grab enemies right back, 
and have them at your mercy. Sadly though, this is also one of my main criticisms of Streets of Rage. Grabbing. It will make more sense later as to why, but in order to grab anyone, all you have to do is just walk your character into another. This does not require any inputs on the controller to do. Now, while on single player, this isn't entirely a bad thing. If you are playing with a friend, however, yes, that does mean you both can unintentionally grab each other and do accidental harm. In fact, friendly fire in general is a big issue I have with the multiplayer of Streets of Rage. I lost count how many times me and whoever the hell I was playing with, be it Gene or George or whoever, had to I, I had to apologize to them and say, whoop, oh, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean that. Okay, a lot of the time it was my fault. But you know what? It's all because we either kept accidentally hitting each other when trying to gang up on foes, or we just accidentally kept walking around and grabbing each other by mistake and slamming the other person to the ground, only to get that awkward look across the room. <laughs> and let me tell you, if looks could bruise. Yeah, so ordinarily, one would ask why grabbing each other would even be a feature in the game at all. But to our surprise, it actually does have a technique. Sort of. If you grab your friend on the proper side, you can actually vault over them doing a sort of flying shoulder tackle. But not only is it impractical, the setup for it is a little obtuse, and really it's just better if you both try to fight like normal and really just try to stay out of each other's way. Emphasis on try. I guarantee most times you pull this team move off, it's not going to be intentional. However, grabbing your opponents is always satisfying. No matter which side you approach and grab them from, you can swing over them to do one of three moves. Either give them the headbutt, the over-shoulder throw, or the fan favorite, German suplex. Mixing up all of these combinations of attacks is simple and easy to do. And while it may not look like much, it really is amusing when you try it yourself. One other thing that's really fun and effective when playing with a friend is getting on either side of the enemy fighter and taking turns punching them back and forth. It really is a great way to take someone tough down. Just hope it never happens to you, because while it may not look at the enemies, they're not stupid. Adding to that amusement, fists aren't the only weapons you can use to torture your enemies. While roaming through a stage, you will come across many breakable objects that will have an item underneath. Health restorative items like apples and chicken, you know, the usual suspects. Non-helpful items to increase your points, like Scrooge McDuck's money bags or gold bars. There's also an assortment of different weapons, from steel pipes, baseball bats, glass beer bottles, smoke bombs, and throwable pocket knives. Enemies will also be carrying a handful of these into fights themselves, so you could easily just steal one off of them. The downside is whenever you are carrying a desired weapon, like a bat, all it takes is one punch for you to drop it. And while getting your hands on one of these weapons can be exciting, you'll find it's pretty damn hard to hold on to them for long, simply because of the windup the swing from the bat needs in order to connect. Eh, easy come, easy go. So, that about covers it for attacks, but there is one last major attack I saved for last. The special. Each player has a one-time special they can use to clear the field, or get out of a tight spot. When you press the A button, the screen will transition back a ways, showing the cavalry riding up to fire either a missile or a gatling gun at the field that you are on. Thankfully, this is one move that doesn't hurt you or your partner. But it is a move you can only do once, and most of the time you'll be saving it for boss fights. It is possible to find a power-up which increases the value, but it usually comes only once and later in the stage, so I wouldn't rely on it too much. Speaking of boss fights, let's talk about them and their stages. I already talked about the city streets of stage 1. At the end of this stage, you'll face a big brute who uses a giant boomerang to strike from a long distance. You can easily punch the boomerang out of the air and wail on him. He occasionally throws a kick out there, but he's not a tough fight. He is the first boss after all, so just stay on your toes and you'll get through him pretty easily. The second stage is the inner city, which to me looks like a very ghetto rundown area, which I personally love. Not ghettos, I mean, I, I don't love ghettos, I just, I love the visual design here with the ghetto background. Uh, I'll, I'll, moving on. The environment here is without question very hostile, and I really like the debris that flows in the wind. 
including the background distance you can see showcasing how far away you are from civilization. The boss of the stage is a creepy one, because he's got this sort of Freddy Krueger quality to him. He's tall, he's slender, and he strikes with razor claws. He can actually be a pretty tough boss fight if you aren't careful, because not only is he fast, but all jump-based attacks are completely useless on him, as he does this cool afterimage effect that hurts you if you try it. I find that if you approach him from the sides, it works far better to your advantage, and trying to avoid a direct frontal assault because, like I said, he's really fast and will likely tag you before you hit him. Stage 3 is also a fun one, because it's on the beachfront area. Yeah, I, I know by this point I'm sounding like a broken record here, but the visuals here are also pretty damn cool, from the distant buildings and the palm trees to the back of the billboards you're passing through. Also, it occasionally rains. Again, in the right hands, the Genesis could show off some impressive blast processing power. The end boss fight of the stage is pretty much the ultimate warrior. He, in my opinion, is pretty weak and easy to fight. He only has one pattern, and that's running straight forward at you, and then stopping to punch where you were standing. He then backs up and repeats the exact same pattern. Just strafing around him to the sides and tagging him after he stops to punch makes this guy a pushover. Alright, stage four. This is where things start to get interesting. You are on a bridge that's in need of repairs. Enemies here will also get a bit of an upgrade, as now they will start sliding and attempting to grab and throw you. And the reason for that is both you and your enemies could potentially fall or get knocked into one of the many instant death pits nearby. Getting thrown into them is no fun, but it is a lot of fun when you grab and throw them in, especially in rapid succession. But come on guys, look at that background. Oh god, it's amazing. The fourth boss can be a little tough because he doesn't leave much room for error. Unlike previous bosses, grabbing this one is not a good idea. By just looking at him, you can see that he's way too heavy to throw, and attempting it is only gonna have you looking like a pancake. He constantly runs across the field spitting fire at you, which makes any frontal assaults almost a non-option. Similar to boss 3, strafing around and trying to tag him from behind before he makes his run is usually the best way to win. Stage 5. Oh boy, now things are gonna start getting tough. Aboard the ship, there are no pitfalls to worry about, but enemies are now going to come in by the handfuls, and for the first time, one of the previous bosses is going to be a mini-boss, leading up to what's probably one of the hardest fights in the game. You fight these two identical twins that look exactly like Blaze Fielding, and my god, they are brutal and relentless. If you have any special saved up, Prepare to use them here, as these ladies are bound to drain a few lives out of you. They are constantly jumping around you non-stop, and if they get in close, they are going to grab you, which will drain a good bit of your life. I'd say grabbing them back is a good strategy, but it's very unreliable, as they will 90% of the time grab you instead. On the multiplayer, this fight is surprisingly easier, because you can at least even up the odds, but otherwise, I'd say your best bet is to stick and move and try to hit them for chip damage. Not only can they be tough to hit because they are constantly moving, they can easily drain the in-game clock, forcing you to lose a life because of it. Good luck with this fight. I've known many players who've gotten game overs here. Stage 6. Uh, uh, this is a stage I admit I'm not very fond of. You are now in a factory, which is covered in conveyor belts and steel compressor traps. The enemies here are pretty much color swaps of what you've already been seeing up to this point, which means they only take a little longer to defeat. Avoiding the steel traps isn't too difficult, but their hitboxes can be a little wonky sometimes, especially in multiplayer. You'd swear you're out of the way, but the game thought otherwise. That hitbox is bullshit. There are no new bosses here, but just a couple of repeats, also with palette swaps. If you've handled them before, you shouldn't have too much trouble this time. Honestly, this whole stage just felt like padding, and it's the one I look forward to the least. Not terrible or anything, just not really impressive. Stage 7. Now we're in the home stretch. This is the elevator. It's a short stage, but if you aren't careful, this could be where your game ends. With each floor the elevator ascends, you will be hit with a small gauntlet of enemies to fight. 
the quickest way I find to deal with them is the exact method you are probably thinking. Throw them off the elevator. Yes, it works, but I can't stress enough how careful you gotta be here. Because guess what? The bad guys have the exact same plan in mind for you. And if you let them, your lives will be gone quickly. Still, with all these bodies being thrown from the tall skyscraper in succession, I can only imagine what it must be like for the cavalry or passerbys down below. Over. But nobody has Stage 8, the final level. It all comes down to this. This final challenge. This final challenge? This final challenge is going to test all of the skills that you've gained up to this point. Only now, you have no specials to help you. From right to left, you will face a gauntlet of enemies complete with a boss rush, facing two of all of the bosses that you faced up until now, including the Blaze Twins at the end. Joy. If you've gotten this far, there's a pretty good chance you will do fairly well here. The stage, despite its challenge, can be pretty generous with healing items and subweapons. Still, like I said, if you aren't quick about it, running out of time can also be a worry. Once you defeat the gauntlet, you will finally be face to face with the syndicate leader, Mr. X. No, not that one, thank Christ. This is where the game throws a surprising but interesting twist into the mix. For the first time in the game, you, the player, are presented with an option. Mr. X is admired by your skill and offers you a chance to actually join his side, which you can either choose yes or no. Surprise, surprise, though, if you choose yes, well, one, you're, you're a sick bastard, and second, it turns out to be a trick, and your punishment? is he sends you down a trapdoor leading you back to the beginning of stage six, which if you recall is the level I don't really find all that fun. Hmm, guess there's a lesson to be learned there, isn't there? If you are playing on two player mode, Mr. X will ask both of you the same question. Here is what's crazy. If one of you says yes to join Mr. X and the other player says no, then there becomes an internal conflict. Now the players are forced to fight to the death until one is left standing. Mr. X will congratulate you on killing your partner and ask for you to join him again. Of course, you'll say no this time because you remember what happened the last time. So now he calls you a traitor and leaves you no choice but to kill him too. Congratulations, you've just gotten the bad ending of Streets of Rage where you have become the new crime lord. Oh my God, this is hilarious <laughs> and totally completely messed up and 100% not canon. But come on, just the fact that you can do this really just goes to show how creative and nuts the Sega developers were. Of course, the real scenario is as you'd expect. You approach Mr. X, deny any and all of his advances, defeat him once and for all, and put an end to his syndicate, achieving the good ending where all three heroes emerge victorious and watch the sunset as a new day approaches. <sighs> Guys, Streets of Rage is a kick-ass game. I don't doubt that a lot of this stems from my own nostalgia, having grown up with it and experiencing the challenges with my family and friends. But after almost 30 years, can you believe it, 30 years? I can still turn this game on and for the better half of an hour, still have a good time playing it and not feel like it was time wasted. The game isn't that long to begin with, but that's also what makes it a fun time killer. The only other game that immediately comes to mind with a similar experience to this is perhaps Star Fox 64 for the Nintendo 64. Another game that's not too long, but has such a fun factor that I just don't mind revisiting them for admittedly a short but very satisfying experience. And that alone is a hell of an achievement for any video game development studio to accomplish. Sure, it would be criminal nowadays to release a game so short that makes it pretty much hard to justify its full price tag. Looking at you, Resident Evil 3 Remake. But if the experience just makes you want to keep coming back and playing it again, well, I personally don't mind it too much. Although I can't say the same for everybody else. Now we've come to this section. I know some of you out there are probably wondering why I haven't talked about Streets of Rage's probably most iconic feature yet. And that's mostly because I wanted to make you sweat a little. 
and I was saving it for now. Viewers, guys, people, the musical soundtracks in these Streets of Rage video games are the stuff of legend. Yuzo Koshiro and Motohiro Kawashima are the known composers for the series, and words almost cannot really express the genius in some of these musical tracks. I am not kidding that if I or any competent group of gamers out there decided to make a top best soundtracks in video games across all platforms, across all time, the Streets of Rage soundtracks would unquestionably be somewhere in the top 10 or top 20. I could even easily see occasions where it could make the top five. Of course, this is all personal preference and based on opinions, but the music in this series is very well known and beloved, even outside the games. There's even been concerts featuring the music of Streets of Rage. The music is so atmospheric, moody, and upbeat that it just kicks with hot beats that you will nonstop bounce your head to. You could easily take this stuff with you on a workout or listen to it in the car or anywhere. I won't play the whole soundtrack for you, but here are a couple of snippets of my favorite tracks from the first game. See what I mean? Oh, it's just good stuff. So there you guys have it. That's my thoughts on Streets of Rage, but hold up. We're not done yet because we got Streets of Rage on the Game Gear. Okay, so before we end off this review, I felt that I should at least draw some attention to the, uh, well, let's be honest, poor man Streets of Rage ports. Understandably, back in the day, it was very common for ports of popular games to be made available on whatever platform was available. Honestly, this is still a practice today, but by today's standards, the quality of each port is usually still held up to the quality standard that makes differences very minute and almost unnoticeable. This was not the case, however, over a decade ago. In fact, it was still happening as recent as the PlayStation 2 and PS3 era. Not everyone can afford the newest, latest, and greatest gaming console. And in some areas of the world, a handful of gamers were still stuck with the Sega Master System, or perhaps somebody instead decided to invest in the Game Boy's competition handheld, the Game Gear, instead of Sega's flagship Genesis Mega Drive. Being that Sega owned all of these things, including Streets of Rage, naturally only made sense, no matter how technologically infeasible it was, and no matter how much the quality of the game suffered for it. Well, here it is. Yep. It's, uh, it's certainly Streets of Rage on a handheld. So, aside from the obvious downgrade in sound and visuals, this port of the game also had some content removed, probably due to the lack of memory space on these cartridges. 
instead of three playable characters, Adam was removed from the game altogether, making this game only feature Axel and Blaze as your options. Logical choices, I suppose. Another giant omission from this port is levels 2, 3, and 7 have been removed entirely, making what was technically a short adventure a now even shorter one. One change that I find in this port that's more intriguing than anything is the ending cutscene images. In the original, you see our three heroes leave the Syndicate base, and then you see Axel shaking the hand of one of the officers that helped out. In the Game Gear port, Adam is nowhere to be seen, and the officer is replaced with Blaze. Yep, not really sure what I was expecting. Also, not sure what I'm really supposed to say about this port. Uh, well, it exists. But believe me, I, I can't find any reason you'd ever want to play this. Back in the 90s, it might have been a decent time killer if you were on the go, but hey, we're in the 2020s now. Unless you're just that big a fan of the series and you got something to prove, I can't imagine anyone today would waste their time on this port. One last thing I'll quickly gloss over is this game was also ported to the Sega Master System as well. Obviously, it too pales in comparison to the power that is Blast Processing, but eh, at least for this one, you can say that all the content is at least there, with no cuts as far as I can see. Still, there is little reason to torture yourself with less than quality content. And I'll stand firm that the built from the ground up Sega Genesis Classic is still top dog around. And let me tell you, Sega, at least for a time, took advantage of it. Streets of Rage may not have the biggest legacy in video games, but it's had sequels, fan games, comic books, and Axel even got the privilege of going on cameo adventures as a playable character in current popular games like Project Cross Zone, where he teams up with characters like Yuri Lowell from Tales of Vesperia, Mega Man X, and he even helps Jill Valentine and Chris Redfield fight the Nemesis monster. So with all that, I think it's safe to say that Axel, his friends, and his games have not been forgotten. And after all these years, with Streets of Rage 4 finally showing up, I hope it stays that way. Okay, yeah, I'll be honest. This sucks. But, you know, given what we had to work with, I guess it's better to have it than not. So, there you guys have it. That's the original Streets of Rage. But, guess what? We're still not done. But for this video, we are. So be sure to join us next time when we take a look at the following games. Streets of Rage 2, the supposed better sequel. Who knows? Depends on what you ask, who you ask, really. And then we got Streets of Rage 3. Lord help me. Anyway, guys, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please be sure to subscribe and follow us and click that notification bell so you can become part of our notification squad and follow up with more videos and see what we got coming in the future. Meanwhile, we will see you next time.